Call the Board of Education meeting back to order at 1.33. And Marilyn, are there people who wish to address the board? There are. Our first speaker is Lamar Lemons. Is he here? Okay, then we'll go to the second speaker, which is Kedon Wilson. And then after that would be Julie Dye. Mr. Wilson, if you'll come to the end of the table here. Everybody will be able to monitor their five minutes up here on this timer. If you've got handouts, if you'll just give them to the person seated closest to you, we'll be happy to get them distributed. And the board does not engage in a back and forth conversation during public participation time. Thank you. As soon as you're ready, we're ready. Okay. Let's give a second to get these uh, distributed. All right. Uh, so good afternoon, board members, everyone at the table, uh, I guess educators <laughs> as well. Um, my name is Kadon Wilson, and I represent a set of companies, a uh, pair of sister companies, uh, recently started within the last year and a half, uh, the first one being Enact Your Future. Uh, that's E-N-A-C-T, a play on the word, uh, the A-C-T test. And uh, we prep students for the A-C-T and S-A-T test in Southeast Michigan, uh, primarily within the Detroit region right now. Uh, the second company I represent, the sister company, is called ProUp. And ProUp, that's P-R-O-U-P, uh, is a company that connects uh, young individuals, high school, school, high school students, and recent graduates with career opportunities. Uh, I'll go a little bit into this in a second, uh, but first, I want to say, uh, I came in and I wanted to throw out a bunch of stats. Uh, initially because I thought that would be impressive to show how much knowledge I have but I'm in a room of seasoned educators and professionals and you guys probably know all the stats already and me being new to the space there's only two that really caught my attention uh, recently I read an article that threw out the numbers 96 and 93 uh, 96 and 93 to some of you maybe your high school or college graduation years uh, it might be the years your children were born to me, 96 and 93 represent the failure rates for Detroit public schools, uh, 96 being the uh, proficiency rate that, uh, for reading that Detroit's public school eighth graders are falling below. So 96% of eighth graders are falling below the proficiency rates for, I'm sorry, mathematics uh, at a 96% clip. And uh, likewise, <coughs> Detroit public school students in eighth grade are at a 93% deficiency for reading, or math reading comprehensive. Those two numbers uh, stood out to me because that means our students in Detroit are not adequately prepared to enter high school. And the problems that trail them from the educational system from uh, primary school are following them into secondary education. And so as a problem proliferates, they're at a disadvantage moving through secondary education and then moving to college and successively into the workforce. The mission of ENACT is to provide educational resources but career opportunities and career advancement for economic advancement for Detroit students, but also for low-income individuals on a whole. Uh, the reason I am here today is to advocate for ENACT Your Future, uh, for our SAT and ACT services. We're currently working with Detroit Public Schools. Uh, we have contracts with 10 of them, I believe, and also the YMCA and GEAR program for Wayne State. Uh, we are trying to implement our system within the schools uh, to act as a bolster for the education they're currently receiving and as an additional resource for students, for teachers, I'm sorry, who may not have the proper resources or kind of complementary services to get their students through uh, to college, to pay for college and be successful in the future. Uh, <coughs> secondarily, ProUp is the career advancement end to enact. ProUp is an opportunity, a resource, an online application and also a mobile app for students uh, of the same age to connect to internships, job opportunities, and career development opportunities they may not be aware of. Uh, we work with partner organizations, uh, employers, and also educational institutions to list their opportunities for, again, the aforementioned internships and jobs. And we connect them to students where they build a profile online on our website, and it's totally free of charge, and they're able to list out their interests career-wise and just basic aspirations. And we have an algorithm that matches them up with these resources um, <clears throat> so that they get a taste of what it's like to get into the real world and to pursue some of their educational uh, aspirations before they actually have to hit the ground running. 
So we believe in tandem, these companies work together to promote a holistic sense of advancement and uh, kind of reaching towards what we envision is a better future. And I know that may sound kind of uh, idealistic and optimistic, but I just came from a meeting this morning of a group called Detroit Civic Optimist. And these individuals are promoting well-being and education for young folks all around. And I believe if there are other people out there, outside of this room, who are doing that, then we in this room have kind of an impetus to do the same and to give the greatest responsibility and accountability to our students. And these two companies, I believe, provide that. And so we're just asking for your support in any way. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Appreciate it. Uh -huh. And uh, I have resources, uh, a couple of handouts in addition. I know I'm going over the time, so two seconds. Uh, a bunch of handouts, and I'd like to leave them with you guys, ladies, for uh, distribution. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Julie Dye is next, and she will be followed by Linda Cypret Kilborn. And I'll take your business cards. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Julie Dye. I live at 8862 Bellamere Court, Jackson, Michigan. I'm a Pokagon Band Potawatomi member. My uh, native name is Nishkan Kerokwe, which means Red Sky Woman. I'm here today to speak about the damage done to Native American children in our Michigan public schools every day through the use of Native American themed mascots, sports logos, and nicknames and the associated use of, of our cultural and religious symbols that mock our culture and our religion. Uh, just uh, about myself, as a teenager, I graduated from Lawrence High School. Our school was sandwiched in between the Hartford Indians and the Pawpaw Redskins. Uh, we were very poor. My parents were farm laborers. Um, they were both alcoholics. As a teenager, I lost a sister uh, who was beaten to death by her boyfriend. A brother, younger brother died uh, in a car accident. So as an only child, a student athlete, and one of two Native American children in the, in the high school, I was forced to watch halftime shows where Indians were killed, town store windows painted with scalp, scalp the opponent, kill the Indians, I'd watch uh, halftime shows with uh, makeshift teepees, uh, ridiculous costumes, <clears throat> and as a teenager trying to reclaim the heritage and our language, it was very difficult um, to see my culture mocked. And a lot of times I would end up in the locker room crying. I felt singled out and targeted and I did not want to be there. How many times do Native Americans have to, have to be killed and annihilated? Uh, it's, it's over and over again. And Native students have enough to deal with without our educational system adding to their psychological woes. I've recently attended some of the uh, school board meetings <clears throat> advocating for change of the Belding Redskins and the Pawpaw Redskins in our lower Michigan. It was the tale of two cities. We, at first, Belding was very contentious, but they have a very good, strong superintendent and principal who helped us educate the community and educate the students. And we're pretty confident that next month they're going to um, vote to change the mascot. Papa, however, is a different story. Um, it's very contentious, uh, actually threatening, uh, the school board has threatened uh, the superintendent with her job. The people in the community have threatened the school board with recall. Uh, the community has refused our educational offerings. So the stakes are very high for indigenous people in our schools. I, I can't, I don't know how to get that, it's underline that it, enough. We're trying to reclaim our language and our culture that was stripped from us due to our history, our history in Michigan and our history in this country. I ask that this board 
please support this Michigan Coalition Against Racism in sports and media in any way possible. It's a very complex situation and it needs to be taken out of the local schools board's hands and out of the local tribal entities hands. Harm is being done to children in our schools. That's all I have. Thank you for being Thank here, you. Julie. Linda Cypret Kilborn is next, followed by Karen Shaman. She can dote them. First, Calman's River and Donjaba. Uh, I introduced myself in the Jibberway language that was taught by my elders um, because we are taught that it's important that we do that because that's for our traditions and that way people know where you come from. I'm also a Anishinaabe and Dal. My English name is Linda Cypert Kilburn. Uh, I reside in the Albion Marshall area. And uh, I have been here many times throughout the years and uh, tried to bring as much education as we could. Uh, unfortunately, like all boards, there's changes constantly with superintendents and members and stuff. So a lot of times it feels like we're being redundant. So today I basically um, wanted to say that I'm not just one individual standing here before you. I uh, represent the Michigan Coalition Against Racism, Sports, and Media as a co-founder. And we would like to say, how long should this shameful practice continue at our public school level as far as mascots are concerned? How many of our Anishinaabe people have endured this disrespectful stereo image of our people? Why should our children be sub subjected to this? Our strong, united voice can answer all of these questions. And basically, the schools either have a choice of making a commitment to their students to educate for change, or continue doing us harm as a crime by bullying and teaching their students this, who are learning from their school systems institutional racism. And don't get alarmed. <laughs> <laughs> See if we can do this. <laughs> okay. On another level, um, we are kind of buddied up with Wisconsin, uh, with the coalition over there. We just did a, a national um, high school journalism convention in Indianapolis um, that was very successful. The students um, really, really were uh, interested. Um, some of them already been writing topics and stuff on the mascot issues and wanted to make changes at their schools at the end of the session, and it was really, really well. So we say <clears throat> teach respect, not racism, in our public school systems um, by education. We believe that education is the way um, to teach, and we try to, try to stick with that as, as far and as long as we can um, before we have to move to further measures. Um, this Indian head, um, as all of you know, represents a spiritual leader for us. So to put this on somebody's gym floor, it would be the same as a priest, a minister, a rabbi, or any other religion. Um, and we definitely would not do that to someone else who trample all over it. Nor would we use symbols like these. You would not see an Afro-American person symbolized in this matter with a, a nunchuck or a spear or something. That would never stand in this country, no more than maybe the uh, little chihuahua dog with the sambarito, you know, or, or whatever. And uh, So these are the type of things that we're trying to eliminate from our school system, not only for our own children, but for other people's children. And being that the clock's ticking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also a member of the Native American movement. <laughs> and this fight has been going on for, for a long, long time, forever, it seems like, with the Cleveland Indians and 
University of Illinois and all the, all the other stuff that goes on. <coughs> um, with that, I can say Redskins, it took a lot of babies that got killed to become Redskins. And if you understand that term and go back into history, you can read about the genocide that took place and still is. So that brings us up to the NASCO movement, which is out of Jackson, Michigan. And they also <coughs> stand for the elimination of mascots out of the public school systems. Uh, they're quite active and have done many, many things. But the problem is we go into these smaller communities that are highly populated, and I'll say popular society, like Pawpaw, which is 87% uh, people from, um, I don't know how to say it, but uh, European descent. <coughs> and for them, it, they don't understand and, and they can't accept this. And um, there's some tremendous things that are going on down there. So I'll just do one more shirt real quick because I know my time is like running out here. Yeah. I'm also a elder of the community. And that brings us down to <laughs> me, a mother, 22, grandmother of, I think we're 58 now, a great grandmother as of Wednesday, 18, and one more coming in December. We are an extended Anishinaabe family. Our children attend sweats, go to ceremonies. They practice their, their religion, which we couldn't freely do for a long time. So for their sake, we're trying to make this change so that they don't have to witness some of the things that's been going on in Pawpaw. I ask you to please pay attention. Um, some of the other people that will be coming up, they'll be telling you a little more about that. But to do two a uh, couple quick uh, quotes here um, from President Kennedy, he said, let us not seek to fix the blame for the past. Let us accept our own responsibility for the future. And Martin Luther King said, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. And this matters very, very deeply to our hearts. So we're hoping that the state can move forward and put an end um, to these things in our public school, school systems and um, to educate, educate, educate. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Karen Shaman is next, followed by Ju Julie Adolfson. Um, I'd like to ask again this month that we, as a, the people of Michigan and you, as the board, send out letters to all the schools in Michigan with Native mascots, asking them to do a self-assessment and list where their logos are and request a moratorium on the purchase of new items using public funding, tax dollars, like Papa recently bought a $30,000 scoreboard. Um, we also want to thank our outgoing board members. Um, we've worked closely, especially with John Austin. And since we'd like to sing an honor song, if you don't mind, if you're able, could you please stand? And this is the AIM Unity Song.
Miigwech. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Julie Adolfson, and she will be followed by Sue Lay. Good afternoon. My name is Julie Adolfson. I am the Region 6 representative for the Michigan Reading Association and a proud special education teacher for the Lansing School District. Two years ago, Michigan Association for Media and Education President Kathy Lester approached me asking Michigan Reading Association to write a position statement on the importance of school libraries and school librarians. At its October meeting, the MRA Board of Directors adopted the following statement, which I would like to share with you now. In pursuit of its mission to empower all Michigan students and educators through liter literacy, the Michigan Reading Association is committed to improving literacy access and achievement across our state. No educator is more uniquely placed to support achievement in these intertwined goals of access and achievement than the school librarian. Research has consistently demonstrated that the presence of a school library staffed by a full-time certified school librarian has positive school-wide effects on literacy achievement across all demographics. A 2003 study conducted by the Library of Michigan found a 35% difference in average percentage of fourth graders scoring proficient or above on the Michigan Education Assessment Program between schools that had qualified librarians and schools without qualified librarians. Additionally, there were statistically significant impact, sorry, significant positive impacts on reading achievements in grades seven and 11, regardless of school or community conditions. Since 2003, Michigan students' access to appropriately staffed school libraries has fallen along with literacy achievement. The number of qualified school librarians employed in Michigan schools has declined by nearly two thirds over the past decade, resulting in fewer than 500 qualified school librarians employed to serve over 1.5 million students during the 2015-16 academic year. In the same period, Michigan was one of five states to show negative improvement on fourth grade literacy achievement as measured by the National Assessment Education Progress. Should current trends <coughs> continue unbated, Michigan is projected to rank 48th in the country by 2030. The value of a school library does not reside simply in its status as an access point for print and digital text. An effective school library is a classroom where students learn valuable information, literacy skills that support their development toward <laughs> career and college readiness. The most critical component of an effective school library is a full-time certified school librarian. According to recent testimony before the Pennsylvania House Education Committee, qualified school librarians are able to not only support classroom teachers in addressing 134 of Pennsylvania's academic standards, which are nearly identical to Michigan standards, they have the professional expertise and specialized knowledge to provide instruction aligned to 44 of those standards alone. Qualified school librarians are not only curators and circulars of resources, they are teachers. Given the current decline in the access to school and public libraries, bookstores, and other sources of print, book deserts have emerged in many of Michigan's most economically challenged communities. As its 2015-16 international project, MRA supported the Little Free Library Initiative to increase literacy access in underserved areas of our state and decrease the spread of book deserts, which is the first step, or while this is the first step, Little Free Libraries cannot supplement school libraries. We must commit to providing access to quality libraries in our schools and continue our, our schools and communities so that Regardless of age or demographics, every student can benefit. It is the reason that 
It is for this reason that the Michigan Reading Association supports strategy 2.7A of Michigan's top 10 on, in 10 years initiative, which strives to ensure that all students have access to libraries and media centers within their school district and or community, that such resources are appropriately staffed to ensure systems integrity. Additionally, the Every Student Succeeds Act provides several golden opportunities to reverse Michigan's downward trends in school library access and staffing. MRE invites educators and policymakers to consider a number of possibilities to empower Michigan through increased literacy, access, and achievement. As a part of the state aid budget, we urge policymakers to include funding for all libraries, particularly school libraries, and the hiring of qualified school librarians. We encourage districts to reconsider the elimination of school libraries and qualified librarians in their annual budget. By working together, we can make a positive, lifelong impact on literacy across our great state. Thank you. Thank you for sharing the statement with us. Sue Lay is next, and she will be followed by Monica Washington Padua. Good afternoon. I'm Sue Lay, an adjunct at Wayne State University in the library school program a retired middle school librarian, and a past president of MAME, whom I represent today. We're honored to receive support from the Michigan Reading Association. The statement presented during the recent Michigan Association for Media and Education, which is MAME, uh, annual conference was held in Grand Rapids earlier this month. This is the third statement issued in recent years in support of school libraries. In February of 2015, the Michigan Library Cooperative Directors Association released such a statement. And in 2014, the State Board of Education signed the first statement of support in recent years. One of MAME's priorities is to increase student achievement in supporting high quality school libraries throughout Michigan. Research shows that there is a correlation between student achievement and an effective school library program staffed by a certified school librarian. We believe that school librarians can play a very important part in helping Michigan become a top 10 state for education within the next 10, pardon me, 10 years. And we hope to be at the table for those discussions. As school librarians, we have seen firsthand the impact of the loss of school libraries and librarians across our state. And it's had a great impact on Michigan students. We know that sharing this information with the educational leaders in Michigan will lead to new discussions and positive changes. As the MRA statement mentions, ESSA does, does provide us with opportunities to change these statistics in a positive fashion. We would ask that as we move toward creating a brighter future for Michigan school students, that we place school libraries staffed by certified school librarians on the map that will lead us toward success. As documented in the MRA statement of support, the number of qualified school librarians employed in Michigan schools has declined by nearly two thirds over the past decade. Surely over the next 10 years, we can work together to reverse that negative trend for the benefit of all the students that we serve. They all deserve equitable access to the information technology rich environment that only a school library can provide. Please join us in our efforts so that together we can make a difference. I thank you. Thank you for being here. Monica Washington Padula followed by Paula Hill. Thank you. I really apologize about my recording going off in the middle of the presentation. I Paula left. She is not able to stay and speak. So I just wanted to let you know that. Buju, Monica and Adishina Kans, Kalamazoo, and Donjaba, Nongong, uh, Anishinaabe Kwe, Minua, Ojibwe, and Da, um, Makondo, and my name is Monica Washington Padua. I'm a resident of Kalamazoo, Michigan, and I identify with the historic Saginaw, Swan Creek, and Black River tribes of Ojibwe. I'm also a mixed race woman that often throws people for a loop sometimes trying to figure out my look, so I do share that. Um, with you. So I want to, if I can pass out a couple of things for each side, I basically just want to show you the Michigan Civil Rights Commission um, 
passed a resolution back in 88. And that basically said that we need to stop using Native American mascots. Um, I'll pass this to you too. Thank you. Um, also included in their handouts are the Polkagan Band of Potawatomi's um, resolution regarding race-based mascots, Native American mascots in the R word or redskin. Um, that is the tribe that services the Paw Paw area where we're focused on right now, in addition to helping a Native American woman in Belding fight the R word mascot there as well. Um, and included in that is um, just a little handout that was put together to kind of share some websites that are really centralized in this fight uh, to make sure that Native American children and people are seen equally in representation in the school system. And unfortunately, we are fighting that uh, institutionalized racism um, that was especially founded on indigenous people being that um, the very unique situation of them inhabiting this land when settlers came. So still fighting that and I want to kind of give a little bit of voice to the record of harm that I've personally experienced not as a student but as an adult addressing the school uh, at their board meetings and I just want to read through this and, and really really share what I personally have experienced as an adult. Um, since February of 2016, I began to approach the Paw Paw School Superintendent and School Board to request that they make a change and retire the race-based mascot and derogatory R-word slur. Armed with research, testimony of another former student in the area who was a student athlete whom you heard, Julie Dye, and the help of the Michigan Coalition Against Racism in Sports and Media, I have persistently approached the board monthly until this past meeting in November. I want to share some of the discrimination that I've experienced. Um, after meeting with the former superintendent, he told me that it was not his personal feeling that um, they should not retire the mascot, but simply it was the town. The town itself was not interested. Um, at the board meetings, we actually experienced discrimination there as well. I want to share some of that with you. Uh, we were told that we were welcome to attend, but they were looking for a new superintendent. So our concern of discrimination was on the back burner at that time, and that language was used. One of our speakers was not allowed to speak because it was on the topic of Native Americans. Um, another, another time Native Americans were grouped together by the president without our consent as a racial group, since we were presumably there to speak about the same topic. Uh, once this was refuted, we were allowed to speak on our separate five minutes. So these are things that Native American adults are experiencing going into schools that are using race-based mascots that don't have the cultural competency and the diversity and anti-racist training to be able to even work together with Native American adults. Um, so much less with children. In August, I organized a protest using the Facebook page, Protest for Native Rights in Michigan. Uh, this page was created to collectively work with other Native Americans who are experiencing harm through race-based mascots and want to work together and protest schools um, in Michigan. Um, at the rally, a reporter from the Herald Palladium reported standing near an older man who asked the officer presiding over our event to kill all of us. We experienced taunting from some community members at the event and also from an 11 year old child who came to stand boldly in front of us and tell us we were wrong. They were not doing anything wrong to our ethnic group at which point I asked my six year old to join us and told the older child that this is my daughter and she is not a red skin. Your mascot is talking about her. Um, after the rally, we've gotten a large community response to come out and, and speak about the mascot. Most presumably, the last two meetings have been very, very well attended by the community. It has been very difficult to feel safe at these meetings. Um, we've experienced, I have personally experienced um, intimidation, harassment, cyberbullying, and the like on the protest page um, where community members come in and they just vent and say what they want to say. So I want to let you know that, um, you know, this is, this is not something that can be left to opinion. You cannot vote on discrimination. Um, if we're going to have anti-discriminatory policies in schools, it needs to apply to the mascots that these schools are, are representing themselves under. It's very, very important. I only have a couple of seconds, but I wanted to see if I could share with you um, a brief audio recording of the very, very end of the meeting. I brought an iPhone speaker. I hope that it works well. And I want to see if you can catch um, a man who was yelling at um, at the group and uh, was using the slur. Give me one second.
you and your husband should be very proud of uh, Oh, my name is Marvin Fleck. I am a redskin. I'm a redskin. That's me. If I want to call myself a redskin, I'm a redskin. And if you want to call yourself a redskin, you call yourself a redskin. Stand up for what you think is right. We're, we are redskins. We're not trying to be bad to you people, for God's sakes. Wake up, Barry. They're here in America. This is, this is <laughs> pawpaw. Pawpaw redskins. You're Just a little bit of what we experienced. Thank you for your Thank time. you for being here. Yeah. Our final speaker, speaker is Lamar Lemons. Good afternoon. I am Lamar Lemons, uh, newly re-elected uh, member of the Detroit Board of Education. Um, well, actually, it's called the Detroit Public Schools Community District. That's what the legislature uh, uh, chose to give our, our, our school district its name. Again, the state is, that's part of being uh, colonized, de facto colonized, is when people begin to name you and give you your own name. Take you. So that's what we're, we're, we're hearing even in the other presentations. We reject uh, the school that they changed the name to Ben Carson. That was not something a Detroiter would have done. Uh, even though he's an African American and a great doctor, he is not something that someone that Detroiters as a collective and uh, would have uh, a school they would named after. They named, they changed our name of school. We did, however, name a school after Barbara Jordan, and they changed that name. And that is something a Detroiter would do and has done. And so we don't let, we don't let people to pick our own heroes. Uh, we can pick our own heroes. Um, um, but I'm, I'm here to, to ask uh, a clear ask, and that ask is that if, if you could help facilitate us receiving the comprehensive annual financial reports for the years of state we would call occupation, which is still on it, or state intervention and ownership. I, I think I got into the whole uh, Native American thing when I said occupation, but it is the same thing. Um, you're, you're imposing, the state is imposing its will on a particular municipality, and we reject it. We reject it. And the citizens, um, unfortunately, I was the only person to, from the elected boards, who we were outspent. They spent over $300,000 a piece for the candidates to elect their slate. Um, and so, and also, we were uh, in a day with a negative media the last six days before the campaign. Nevertheless, I was able to prevail, and also uh, my wife, so, um, who is very familiar um, on, on the, what's been going on in Detroit. So. Um, we will be, we will quickly um, attempt to um, inform and educate the incoming board members as we are uh, um, meeting as we speak. But if you could help us get, because we don't believe, first and foremost, that we should be under um, this uh, Financial Review Commission. It's in the legislation. It is a penalty usually reserved for those under bankruptcy. We, were not, we didn't go through bankruptcy, we didn't have the discovery of a bankruptcy, and we didn't have the, but we have the penalties of a bankruptcy. The state is imposing a de facto bankruptcy on us, the penalties of bankruptcy, without going through uh, the discovery and, and, and indicating the causes and origins of the deficit. And so in, in order to just wipe it out and, lead, and keep us from having, being an institution, Detroit Public Schools, which could sue and get this information, they dissolve the district rather than make it transparent. And we believe that was the motivation because in other old code, new code situations, the, it is the old code that has to toxic debt. But we have no debt. So there was no reason to, to bifurcate the district. And so now at a cost of $20 million, $20 million that could have been used to, in, in the classroom. From the, from the 600 a million that the uh, state is uh, uh, paying down on the debt that they created. 
Also, you've heard the academic performance. In 1999, we were 22 to 25% of the students were, uh, were not at grade level. And now, 96, well, you're hearing numbers at 92, 96. That is a direct result of state intervention. And so, we would ask that they please stop intervening and allow us to fix our own school district to remove this onerous uh, financial review commission, which I know you do not have the authority, but we still will be asking for its removal. And in the interim, at the very least, the very, very least, have us present to us the comprehensive annual financial report, also called the CAFR. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lamar. <clears throat> Next item uh, on the agenda uh, on Committee of the Whole is presentation on success with Technology Readiness Infrastructure Grant, or known as TRIG. The TRIG grant has been funded by the Michigan Department of Education since 2012. In this final year of grant funding, we are pleased to share with the board successes of this grant, including supporting 96% of our students and districts testing online, as well as providing $78.5 million in direct savings on devices for our districts. Presenters are Linda Forward, Director of Education Improvement and Innovation, Michelle Rybrandt, Education Technology Consultant, and Dave Carey, TRIG Project Director. Please. Thank you. Good afternoon. We're excited to bring this project to you uh, one more time. We have brought you reports periodically and uh, want to share with you some of our successes, some of the work that's been done. I must tell you, as I have said before, this is one of the most exciting projects I've worked on because everybody put their regional and uh, entity ownership requirements aside and worked toward the good of the project and toward the good of the state in, a, in accomplishing what's been done. Before we um, go forward and just to show you what it took to make this all happen, um, if I could have the people that are in the gallery stand that have worked with this project. Um, you will find representatives from DTMB, from CEPI, from MAISA, including their executive director, Bill Miller. You will find staff from our shop and from other uh, offices across the department. We couldn't have done it without all of those people helping to make this real. And so I thank you, and I hope that you'll enjoy hearing what they've done. You've heard from uh, other uh, project managers as we've gone forward, and Dave Carey is the new project manager for this this work, and so we're delighted to have him with us. And Michelle Rybant joined our office to work on um, all things technology and has been working on this project more closely in the last year. So just wanted to share with you some of what's been going on and what we've done. The vision of the group was to empower every student to excel in next generation assessments, and that was the first part of this. It was to help get the online assessments launched and have them happen successfully in Michigan, and they did. Many states crashed and burned that first year and had to stop mid-stride and return to paper and pencil, and Michigan went off without a hitch. We were able to pull that off. Um, we also wanted to leverage that technology, though, for learning and for, to help kids achieve lifelong success in a global economy. Uh, in addition to getting the online uh, assessments going, we have been able to provide opportunities to increase capacity to deliver personalized learning in districts and classrooms. And you know that that's something we're trying to get at more and more, is what, what does each child need? What do they need to personalize their outcomes? And so we're working on that. We also have built sustainable collaborations. One of the nice things about this grant is that folks have focused on how do we keep this going after the money ends. And so as we'll show you, most of the components of this are now sustainable without additional grant funding. Um, and then we wanted to uh, increase the capacity of local districts to provide ubiquitous access at any time, any place, any way, any pace learning. So how do we get this personalized learning in place for all kids? Structure and funding. I want to, there's an asterisk on this one, so I want to be very clear. This is funding over the years that we've had the money, but this includes allocated funds. And so in some cases, districts or others may not spend all of this, but this is what we've put out. District participation monies have gone out at uh, 50 more, 54 million plus. The consortia funding in order to support each of the five consortia has totaled out to 3.8 million. And statewide activities is 100 and almost 107 million. And we'll show you how that's been used as we go forward. The final report will uh, show what we've actually spent, but this is real close. Uh, one of the things, the first challenges we had was test readiness. And in 2014, we weren't sure we were ready. We hoped that we were. 
in 2015, 80% of the schools in the state participated in online assessments. In this past assessment season, 96% of the schools used the online tools for assessment. This one I'm not going to read, to, read all to you, but um, you will see that in most cases <coughs> where there were challenges, we've been able to, um, to improve on those challenges. So for instance, more information about online assessment from MDE seemed to be a problem at 22%, and in the most recent assessment year, it was 13%. The one that's grown in a positive way is the next one. No challenges. We're ready for that online testing. So 28% of the school districts and entities felt that way. If you go on down through them, uh, you'll find teacher professional development listed, teacher uh, professional relating to technology and the use of technology, as well as um, online testing. So there's a lot of issues here that we were able to uh, glean from the survey. 100% of the trig participating ISDs, 56, LEAs, 530, and PSAs, 167, have um, have weighed in on this to give us this information. So in order to answer those questions, uh, the TRIG project developed a large group of statewide activities. Some of you who have been uh, tracking with us on this for some time remember that originally the vision was that there was m money given out and there would be maybe 10, 15 grants given out for one time. We've managed to put this together to, to serve for four years and provide these kinds of services. I'm going to turn this over to Dave Carey now to explain e what each of these means and, and what's going on with them. Thank you. Um, it, it's a good way to look at the 11 activities together. And, and while I'll talk about them in isolation, it's the cumulative impact and it's the way we do the work statewide that <coughs> magnifies it, that really leverages it. But I think it'll help if I at least give a little bit of information on, on all the activities. So we started with information. Uh, we knew if we were going to do online assessment and do it well, we needed to know what existed in our schools. So at the time I was a local administrator and I completed the MTRAC survey. Um, it, it was foundational in, in giving us that if you've never done anything before, how do you know whether it's going to be successful or not? And you sure can't wait till kids are there for that question to be answered. So MTRAC was a, a surveying tool that, that all districts completed that informed us on their state of readiness that then allowed us to target assistance uh, to those districts and those buildings that needed it. Uh, the, the future of technology in Michigan is going to rely on good information and good data. So while MTRAX was a tool that really helped us with test readiness, um, I think the next phase of, of what Michigan's going to need is information on instructional readiness. Um, and it's nice to have a tool that did what it was supposed to do, um, but it certainly won't be able to answer all the questions we'll need in the future as we talk about instruction. Once we establish that baseline, that, that how, um, how are we doing what's happening in the districts, we use two targeted assistant grants. Uh, the SRS grant on the left of, of the graphic um, use the MTRAX data and individual district circumstances to target assistance to get buildings and districts ready for test readiness. It uh, could do everything from professional development to coaching to devices, uh, wireless infrastructure. It looked at the needs, it looked at the barriers and went about addressing them. The other one, the, tar the targeted site transformation, was a one-to-one was a -one model. Knowing again the direction technology is going, um, having a best practice of one-to-one -one development in schools. And these are uh, a variety of schools regionally, uh, geographically across the state and of all different sizes. But it gave us two laboratories to really uh, develop our thinking and the best practices around addressing school and district need. The data service collaborative activity was a, a regional collaborative. It, was, it allowed districts to put proposals forward for funding. And I included five of them there. Um, I also include the ROI chart because all of our projects that was a high standard for what is the benefit later, what is the return on your investment. And it's interesting, out of these very relatively small projects, uh, collaborative purchasing provided a, a lower price point on uh, necessary software solutions for districts statewide. Green Pupil Accounting is really, <laughs> really taking off right now. I think when you look at the amount of resources, time, energy, effort, going into pupil accounting, just the physical paper alone and trying to use a, a, a somewhat old system um, for what could be a very modern process, we're seeing really uh, great potential in green pupil accounting. Uh, next generation science assessments, uh, the My Case Consortium uh, is the integration of a, a finance HR system, and then EDFI is targeting uh, resources to students based on their specific individual needs. 
So while they're small projects, they're all ones that we learn lessons on that can be magnified and implemented statewide. These are kind of like some seed money projects that have, again, potential to pay dividends for a long time. My Open Books, this is one that we almost have to update every day. Um, right now, when I talk about the My Open Book project, uh, it is an a open educational resource. It is a digital textbook that you can download. So at my house, it's on my phone, and it's on my son's laptop. Um, completely free, takes about five seconds to download. And there is a scope and sequence now of social studies digital textbooks available for kids all across Michigan for absolutely free. Uh, the last three books are in development right now, which will be the Early Childhood Resources and the World Studies. We are downloading, on average, a thousand textbooks a day, seven days a week, since July 1. We're over a quarter of a million total downloads. So again, if I, if I take my personal history, if I look at myself as a teacher, I was a fifth grade teacher. When I started teaching, my neighboring teacher and I had to share a cart of 30 books that were older than I was at the time I started teaching. If I go later as a building principal and I had to balance budgets, a lot of times social studies resources did not make the list of needed purchases because it was competing with math and reading and staffing. You look at our greatest area of need across Michigan and you can make a case that social studies is right there. So for this free resource to be available right now for everyone is a big deal. Uh, but yeah, a thousand a day, uh, a small class A high school a day is getting downloaded right now of the open books. Classroom readiness, this is uh, teacher professional development, uh, teacher professional learning. It is a, again, a, a, a consumption or a marketplace for us is educators like myself and my family. I put a lot of stuff back in that context. Um, when my wife is planning, it's usually in the evenings, and it's usually when she has time to think about her class, their needs, and what she needs to know or get better at to help them. So EduPass is an is a online learning portal um, created by Michigan educators for Michigan educators. Over 120 modules or classes in it right now. It is on a variety of topics. You can start it, and if you don't like it, you just turn it off. You're not, there, there's not a cost to it. It is much like going to sites that interest you, and when you find something that interests you, you stick with it. And it, it just provides that wealth of resources across boundaries, across geography, to educators all across Michigan for their professional learning, their professional growth. Um, we've got some great partnerships going with EduPass right now. Um, during the public comment, um, I was reminded of some of those. Uh, we partnered with, obviously, MDE um, to look at cultural competencies and cultural literacy, uh, working with several tribes right now. They're helping us create modules for teachers on being better teachers of cultural awareness and diversity. The, the early literacy grant, we're working on modules around coaching essentials, so those people that are in districts working with teachers to be better at targeted literacy assistance. EduPass is just a place where you can go. It's an infrastructure where you can put online professional learning. And just since February, we've only been live since February, we have over 4,000 teachers that have uh, created accounts in EduPass. Device purchasing, if you can't get excited about this, there's not much, there's, there's not much you can get excited about. Um, over the past four years, we've put uh, half a million devices into schools. And the price point for devices, I, I remember a few years ago, there was a big news story about the $100 laptop and how that was going to really transform someday um, education. Uh, we are past that point. There was a really great Chromebook that met all of our de device specs and testing specs, and um, it, it went sub $100 uh, by the time that the incentives and the, the project had done some really, really rigorous uh, competitive bidding. So direct savings to school, you know, 1 point or 112 million is not an unusable number. Um, half a million devices over four years. You start getting into scenarios where you can realistically get on replacement cycles for devices. Again, what have districts always struggled with? Okay, we, we can get some computers through a bond issue or through some other uh, mechanism, but we can't keep up and replace them. The price points and the way that we've tackled this collaboratively with partners like REMC and across this state really puts this as a reachable target. And then you leverage that with other projects like My Open Books. When you're no longer buying the textbook because it's free, and the price point of the computer is sub hundred dollars, and you're doing these things in conjunction with some projects we'll talk about in just a minute, you start really getting a picture of this world that can exist that is at our fingertips right now that will change education. Not because technology is always the answer, but because it can leverage really good answers into really good practices. 
E-rate. Everyone here has struggled with budgets to a tremendous degree. Um, but every time that we talk about federal dollars that are going to go to someone, and Michigan can have a strategy to maximize our E-rate funding, where we can bring in more federal dollars because we're smart about how we support schools, we're smart about how we communicate. Um, in 2015 alone, we brought in $67 million in E-rate discounts. Uh, we all pay a little bit of that on our cell phone bills. Um, but any chance that we can have a strategy, and that's one of our projects, to maximize the value of E-rate and bring more federal dollars in, it, it spurs growth, it spurs building, it spurs broadband projects, um, and is real dollars to the state. My son, again, you, you look at the picture, and if you know the baby bell history of how phone networks used to work, and you see what we had to where we're going, you picture a intranet, our network of educators, where we have a safe, secure, <coughs> dedicated system for collaborating and using data and transferring information. Um, we've got nine of 11 of our core segments built, but what does this mean? It means there will be a 100 gig core with 10 gig sites at every one of our ISDs. You gotta love the redundant loop that runs to our neighbor out to the west. Um, again, what does it do? It removes barriers. As a teacher, as an administrator, as a central office administrator, dollars, distance, bandwidth, safety and security. Those four things kept me from a lot of cool collaborations that I could have pursued. But when you think about an ISD like Copper Country, who's one of our leaders in the TREG project, hosting a solution for the whole state, if you think about firewall protection or antivirus, just being able to collaborate knowing that it was a secure network, it opens up a lot of possibilities, both fiscal savings, which is great, but opportunities for teaching and learning, which is amazing. The data hubs, it gets a little bit into the weeds here, but I'll try to keep it um, in, the, in the two simplest ways I say it. The data hubs are these five locations that are going to use those other pieces I talked about, like the SEN, to create opportunities for systems integration and actionable data. So the first slide you're seeing is like this meat grinder slide. All these systems come together, and what comes out are systems that work. And I can give an example. There was a, a school district, Schwartz Creek wanted a new alert system, which is the system that calls me and says, hey, you know, my, my, my son's bus slid into a ditch. Everybody's okay, or school's canceled. And you get really nervous about that system, because if it doesn't work as an administrator, that's a really big deal. And I also have my student information system, Power School is the one I'm most familiar with. Um, when these two systems work, it really, really, really makes me feel good as an administrator. When they don't, I get really nervous really fast. And as an administrator, I'm, I'm not always likely to change these systems because they're working together, and if I change them, they might stop working and that could cause problems. But Schwartz Creek had done the work to be a data hub district. They had signed on, which means when they, when they bought a new system, Bright Arrow, I believe, is what they got for an alert system, it was truly a matter of minutes before those two systems were greenlit and integrated. Which, what does that do? Well, one, it makes it easy because then my tech staff can help with issues of teaching and learning instead of getting these two systems to work. It's a solution that's replicable across every other district in the state. So when these systems work together, everybody gets the benefits, not just the tech team that designed it in that one shop. But it also allows me to shop for price and for features because I'm not being held by fear of systems not working together. So systems integration is, is one piece of it. The actionable data, though, as a classroom teacher, um, I really like. You can see in the small, small print, uh, you can see state assessments, local assessments, attendance, these different indicators that right now these systems don't always work together. I may print a report for one and look at my student information system for another and then maybe check with the office on how's attendance going. But I can have an actionable dashboard. This is an existing dashboard in the hubs right now. It's an EdFi standard format. EdFi is that great language that lets them talk. But I can have dashboards that let me see at a glance how students are doing across a multiple series of factors and then drill down into it. It is not just the uh, overall student dashboards, it's the early warning systems. So this is based on a, a national model of, of what puts kids at risk of not graduating. And I can track as a, at a student or as a building or as a district, district level all those factors as well. And then it alerts me. As kids move into the early warning list, um, I'm aware of it and I can target uh, systems of support around it. As they move off, I can celebrate it. But again, I've seen too many principals, myself included, that had chart paper across their walls. And I can remember writing names and having color-coded stickers and then crossing names out and adding it too. And each time I did that, it required me or a member of my staff or my teachers updating this paper list. 
and I'm looking at this, the, the, the state that we can be at right now with tools that exist, that I can have this kind of always actionable updated dashboard available. And then just another way the data hubs are so valuable, um, access for parents. Uh, you, may be used to, you may be used to logging into your student's uh, PowerSchool account or whichever student information system they use, and you can see their scores or their attendance for their local assessments. Uh, we've done an amazing collaborative project with MDE, uh, DAS and separate wonderful partners throughout, where a parent can use that same authentication and view their, their, their child's state assessment scores. This year, how did I get mine? Well, it came in an envelope from my kid's school. And I just think about the difference between that and me as a parent being able to see those different indicators in different ways um, just in my student's regular account. So it's got some real potential for all those different ways of looking at data uh, at the teacher, at the student, at the parent, at the district level. And then Data Hubs makes a pretty compelling fiscal case as well. Um, if you look at the three green bars on the left of your screen, those are just three different categories, ways we spend money on data. So the fourth one is the sum of those first three. So we spend a big chunk, over $160 million on data each year. From some initial analysis, it looks like we have an opportunity, if the hubs were fully functional and implemented, for about $56 million in savings. Um, those are real dollars. Those are real dollars that can, again, again, go towards everything else we're trying to accomplish in Michigan besides creating these integrated systems and this actionable data for teachers. Uh, we've been blessed. The, the, the individual districts and the ISDs have led this effort for so long and really been champions of data, but we have a chance now to expand their work regionally up into a state level that can make an efficient system for everybody. And integration needs, even, even if we had all the systems we had right now working, that's the left-hand column, um, you can still see the needed integrations are on the far right. And again, this was a survey of hundreds of our districts. These are our district experts in technology and data. Uh, we've got a long way to go, and the hubs can provide that answer for turning that orange column more into the green. So there's a fiscal case, there's a time and energy case, uh, there's a lot of good reasons for us to get much better with our data. So there's our projects, 10 of them, all together, and there's a lot there. Uh, but it is the way that they work together, these 10 pieces, that give them their power. And I don't know, Michelle, do you want to kind of jump in there to yeah. kind of paint that picture? Yes, because I know TRIG, <clears throat> on the left-hand side, that TRIG structure, from an intermediate school district perspective and from the state <clears throat> perspective and as a steering committee um, member as well. And so that structure of TRIG has allowed this almost unbelievable amount of collaboration across the state because there is representation that is so dispersed and yet so organized that the communication from districts to intermediate school districts to the steering committee all of the different activities is really in place and as an <coughs> intermediate school district person we were aware of all the activities and then how we could contextualize those activities within our own region through this communication system so the consortiums on the next slide work really closely together and meet monthly themselves to distribute the information to do kind of a check on where everybody is around the activities do we need to focus more on this do we need to do this and through these <coughs> collaborations <coughs> they've initiated a lot of other technology related activities beyond TRIG and I think that that also speaks to the power of TRIG where the collaborations born there have now been um, really amplified through regional efforts that are underway and will continue to be underway after TRIG is completed. So it, it's not an easy recap, and truly at any point, if you need more detail, we're always glad to provide it. But if I kind of sum it up, what have we done? Um, we, we, we took care of online assessments. And whatever the future is for assessments in Michigan, that is experience and dollars well spent because online assessments are going to be a part of any direction that we choose to go. The sustainable fiber infrastructure, regional data hubs, lower costs, better access, reliable, high quality data, the discounted purchasing and technology devices, the professional learning for teachers, um, it's been a pretty impressive slate. And I had the advantage of just coming in this last year, I'm just over a year right now and I got to be a part of the success, but there were some folks that just poured heart and soul over years. Uh, MDE has been an amazing partner, uh, MAISA and all the ISDs, the local districts. It was, a, it was a big, hard, collaborative effort. 
but it's been incredibly successful as well. Sustainability, this is a big piece, but all of these grants, all these projects were written with sustainability in mind. So what does that mean? Well, I'll, I'll kind of start with the SRS, the green circle, and kind of work my way around. Um, SRS, Targeted Site Transformation Data Service Collaboratives. Three amazing projects that taught us a lot, produced a lot of good results, and whose structures are still in place if we ever need them again. If we ever need targeted assistant models for SRS, we've got a great model. You can dust that off, you can start implementing it again. The money spent was good money, it'll have good long-term impact, but it doesn't continue forever. When you get into the My Open books, um, MDE is, has joined the Go Open initiative. I mean, it's 14 states that, that have signed on to this national Go Open initiative. OERs are here to stay. So the, the continued work of MDE is going to let the Open Book Project continue to grow, to expand into far more than just a series of textbooks, even though I love the series of textbooks. EduPass is a platform. Um, again, it, it, it exists. The infrastructure is there. As we've got partners that want to help target professional learning, all we have to do is then get the experts into the platform, and it can be shared on a statewide basis. Device purchasing, Remsey has been a great partner in collaborative bidding and will continue to lead that project. E-rate, MDE again is looking to take a leadership role in E-rate to continue that support for locals and bringing more federal dollars into the state. MySEN right now has a $9.4 million request into E-rate. And if this E-rate strategy is successful, it will bring 9.4 million real dollars into Michigan that is gonna allow us to keep expanding the reach of that broadband network uh, not just the ISDs, but to every district in, in Michigan. MTRACs, we know we'll need educational data. Whether that's the right tool long term, that'll be determined. But we'll always need to keep enhancing our data sets around instructional technology. And then the data hubs are really on the cusp of providing um, what we've sought for so long, which is a coherent way to use data and systems integration across the state. So thanks to the incredible partnerships, these projects will continue on. Um, they can always be enhanced and magnify through additional funding, but the initial investment isn't lost. Um, it doesn't go away. It's not like someday someone's gonna look back and say, oh boy, this send, that's what we bought five years ago. No, it will be being used, and then we just have choices whether to enhance or not. So with that, Brian, back to you. All right, great program that has delivered a lot to return on investment for our taxpayers and our educators. <coughs> Is there any questions or can we Move on, Dr. Z, please. Uh, from time to time, you hear concerns about you know data breaches and stuff like that. We just comment on that uh, with respect to our, our session. Sure. I'll start, and then please feel free to add. Uh, I was in a conversation recently, and it was a really good one. Um, it was expressed by a school leader. They said, "You know, I'm nervous about getting into that great big set and, and what that could mean." And it was a great point for us to kind of stop and reflect that right now they're in the great big internet which on a scope of magnitude exceeds far greater any level of control or responsibility you can do with an intranet. So it really, from a, and it was a great point for me because it gave me one great language to share, but, but framed it for me and to say, we're shrinking our world, we're containing our data. Even if we use that as our portal to the great big, it, it provides, I think, a level of safety and security that is, is a benefit to us. But that is, of course, anytime you're talking technology, an area of concern in an area that we need to monitor. But I felt really good that that perspective helped me kind of think about it differently. And I would just like to say at the data hub level, there are five data hubs around the state. And really those concerns about security in transit and at rest were baked right in at the beginning. And that Ed5 format that the data is being stored in and the extra protections that the hub sites have put in at the send level and at the server level have been incredible. So uh, I think the districts that are in the hubs now are realizing too that they have a redundancy in their data sets. So if their own local systems are compromised in some way, they have the hub there as an additional support. So it's actually built a lot of redundancy and security into the system for both the SEN and the hubs. All right, thank you very much. You Appreciate the thank presentation. We do have full copies of the ROI survey. I showed some slides and we'll leave these for the board. And again, if you have any questions, let us know. Thank you very much. The last item on the committee of the whole agenda is discussion regarding criteria for grant programs. There's four grant programs, uh, culinary arts, joint capital projects, Michigan science technology, and 10 cents a meal. 
Any questions on any of the grant criteria? Seeing none, approval of State Board of Education minutes. Approval of the minutes of the regular and committee of the whole meeting, October 11th, 2016. Is there a motion? Been moved and supported. Is there any questions or comments on the minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed the same. Motion carries. John Austin, report, please. Not much happened this month. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so maybe next month uh, is the time when um, Kathy and I can share a little bit about uh, what we're proud that we did together, uh, but also what we might encourage in terms of our colleagues to pay attention to and hopefully accomplish moving forward. Um, I did want to just reflect a bit on you know the election. Um, it it certainly suggested to me that certainly here in Michigan, but elsewhere, there are a lot of people who are anxious, um, even angry, but certainly anxious about whether their community, where jobs are coming from, economic insecurity, um, what's their future, what's their kids' future. Um, it was a reminder to me that we need to work harder, all of us, to help everybody, all of us understand that the way to meet those anxieties really is to, uh, and create opportunity and create jobs is to help more people get higher levels of education uh, and to uh, not blame others, whether it's immigrants or uh, the Chinese. I mean, the answer to trade is to help more people get the retraining and new skills they need to be able to compete at a higher level and uh, participate in a different economy. Uh, it's not the answer to economic insecurity is not to promise people to get them back their old jobs, but to help them have the skills and abilities and be the entrepreneurs and the creators of the work and the jobs of the future. And we need to do better to help meet people's real needs because that's what will be helping us advance economically. But also, it is so destructive and it's not the answer to blame migrants or immigrants or people who are different for those anxieties and insecurities. I mean, I was trying certainly in my campaign, but I would remind us all this state was built by migrants and immigrants. Um, when Henry Ford opened the Rouge factory in 1917, 100,000 people showed up for work from 47 different countries speaking all sorts of different languages. African Americans from the South and whites from the South and Appalachia built this state and came here seeking a better life. Um, when you look today at uh, Holland, is half the kids in those schools are Latino. And that's wonderful, but they need a great education if they're going to be so they can create a brighter Michigan. I was in Hamtramck, you know, what an amazing diverse community with all those different nationalities, people from around the world coming and so happy to be here in Michigan and America to seek a better life and that is the future and that's wonderful. Uh, and look at Southwest Detroit where the Mexican community has recolonized and made more vital whole neighborhoods. I mean, that's the wonderful future and we need to embrace that as a very, uh, as the way economic activity happens. I was reading recently New York City, which is very prosperous. Part of the reason it's prosperous is a third of the people there are not native born. A third. We keep remaking a great city and making it dynamic economically. Uh, and when you send messages of intolerance or fear, or people who are different or immigrants or Latinos or Muslims, or even as we've been through, LGBT uh, brothers and sisters and children, you're sending a terrible message about to what kind of state and community you are. So we have to help us all see that we need to send the affirmative message. Uh, if we're going to grow and, and actually meet those insecurities and create jobs and make economic activity happen, we have to help more people get educated to the highest possible levels, really. And we need to be the most welcoming and inclusive place. And so that's work we all got to do. And that's why we also definitely need to appreciate those real anxieties that led to many people to vote in real fear, uh, but we need to deliver the real solutions to those anxieties, uh, not the ones that help the people blame other people, people who are different. So that's why it's particularly important. We all have to very strongly, though, condemn and reject um, folks who have encouraged and the behavior of school children now empowered to make fun of other Latino young people 
or make fun of Muslims and feel it's okay. I mean, that is unacceptable. That is totally unacceptable. And that's one of the unfortunate byproducts of this election. But I feel, you know, again, optimistic that we will, over time, um, help us come together and we will make real headway on the things that can grow our economy, that can help people uh, in Michigan uh, participate in it. And uh, that's going to be important work for all of us in the future. And I was reminded, too, listening to our um, wonderful, and I'm very honored, and I'm sure Kathy is with the honor song from our, our friends from the, our native community. Um, those kinds of attacks that we're seeing a bit more on uh, immigrants or Latinos or Muslims, mm -hmm. that's what our Native American kids have experienced every day of their lives. And it is unacceptable. And it's not who we are in Michigan. So we did send out a letter reiterating our resolution of 2003 that um, discouraged and encouraged, discouraged the uh, schools from continuing the use of the mascots and insignias and encouraging them to get rid of them with the endorsement of the Civil Rights uh, Commission. Uh, it is important that folks take that seriously. Uh, I think our friends here were asking us again today whether we would continue to ask districts to do more self-assessment and perhaps faced with an inventory of the, the specific um, totems, mascots, insignia that they are using, it might also push them to reflect on these are deeply, deeply offensive to real people and discouraging of their feeling optimistic, good, and accepted and as part of their culture. And even if it's a small number, any number of young people or adults who are discriminated against or made to feel insignificant, unvalued, even um, second, more than second class, uh, treated, treated horribly, that's unacceptable. So we may, this, you, you and your wisdom and the board may want to encourage other um, uh, communications to encourage school districts to do that kind of self-assessment. Because uh, I think our collective job is to recognize the rights of every one of our people, but also help them feel empowered and engaged to get educated. I mean, that's the work of this board. Uh, in the state. So again, those are my reflections and two. I, I'm trying to appreciate what drove the anger and frustration, but also really say we have to meet it with the real answers, not the phony answers or the distracting answers or the, the hurtful answers, which are to blame other people who are different. Uh, so I, I would encourage us to get about that work too with our fellow citizens. Thanks, John. Uh, Visited a couple schools, Grand Blank and Weberville. Got to see uh, in Weberville schools how they operate a farm and how the students are engaged in that whole process from planting to uh, pulling up what they planted to selling what they planted and figuring out the economics around it. The same with the, the animals at the, on the farm to programs in uh, Grand Blank, CTE, college credit, options that kids have just a lot of great things happening in our schools and I got to go into a classroom of a teacher who's been teaching for 53 years and see how she still commands the classroom and how the students were engaged uh, in their own work and how she was working that classroom and just a real exciting opportunity. Uh, with that I agree with what John has said on terms of how we treat each other. I did send out a statement. We're doing a dual thing with the Office of uh, Civil Rights where we're sending out a joint memo encouraging districts to take stance and provide some tools and resources for districts to use uh, to help them go through that process. So we certainly want to, we understand that bullying has occurred before the election, but we also understand this election and the low level of, of debate and discussion that took place and the attack on some people has impacted our schools and we need to be on top of that and make sure all of our students are feeling safe. So we're doing that. We'll share that with the board, that information with the board as it goes out today. Report of the Teacher of the Year. Tracy, please. Yep. Does your letter with the Civil Rights Commission give suggestions to school districts how to deal with Yes. <coughs> Tools and resources. Because okay, some of them might not be as skillful as yep. others. And offering for our departments to help if they need us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just thought you, the, the idea of fear, <laughs> um, John Gordon 
describes it as false evidence appearing real, taking F E A R, mm -hmm. and um, and ways to overcome that are really involved in the, the social emotional learning aspects that I hear at this table throughout every it's, it's interwoven throughout every presentation. I take notes um, throughout, and and it comes up over and over and over again, and how to make that actually happen in the classroom so that we're actually seeing different types of results based on this type of thinking is what I um, have really been driven by. And the woman you see up there is Cheryl Hutchins from Stony Creek Elementary in Comstock Park, and she was my high school cheerleading coach. Um, she was not a, uh, a teacher at the time, because that was a really long time ago when I was <laughs> cheering for uh, Grand Rapids Public Schools um, Union High School and Cheryl um, developed an awesome capacity around how to be able to really um, celebrate and capitalize on the gifts that each of us brought to the team and um, understanding that we're all not going to see things the same way but we're always taking the time to understand things from everybody's different points of view so that we could get at the real work um, that we were um, wanting to be successful. And I know not everybody always perceives cheerleading as competitive, but we ended up being a top 10 um, finalist in the state, which makes me think of the work that we're doing here, wanting to be in the top 10. And um, Cheryl's focus was always on relationships and um, Again, changing the narrative for each person and influencing our identities. Um, so there's our team. She had quotes all the time that she infused into everything we were doing and um, created these t-shirts for us um, that she, she lived it out in everything she did but wanted us to have reminders about what she believed about us and our responsibility to strive for greatness and the idea that achieving greatness really is a responsibility. And as educators, sometimes we maybe look at it as, no, it's, it's about helping others be great. Well, if we're, we're not serving as models of how to achieve greatness, then um, our students lose that um, model in the classroom every day of what it looks, sounds, or feels like to think and act like someone who's striving for greatness. So. Um, seeking out techniques in order to empower students and um, putting more of the ownership of the learning on them is something that we have to do more by showing versus telling and modeling our thinking um, and by engaging them in collaborative structures and teaching them how to be social in a purposeful way. And I recently was um, invited to share to testimony with the House um, Education Committee and I, I taught the purposeful talk procedures and, and showed kindergartners engaged in the same types of purposeful talk and the way they paused and paraphrased and really parked their thinking so that they could listen to seek understanding versus listening to respond, to which Amanda Price felt that legislators all need to be trained in <laughs> purposeful talk. Um, and. From there, then, just talking about um, in John Hattie's work, um, he's a researcher who has over 1,200 meta-analyses of, of what works in classrooms, and what has come out most recently is collaborative teacher efficacy, efficacy being the um, greatest change agent in student learning, um, and so developing the capacity of teachers, and I heard it earlier too um, from Vanessa and talking about um, thinking about the whole child and the, the resources are in the classrooms and they have the thinking and when they learn how to collaborate in a purposeful way, we get powerful results and it's making that happen, having the job embedded professional learning and, and developing the capacity of our the teachers that are in there working with the students. Um, and so some of the thinking from cognitive coaching, adaptive schools, habits of mind, the whole thinking collaborative fosters those um, abilities. And so for me, a transformation in my classroom took place when I was able to take those values and beliefs that I learned from Cheryl 
all those years ago as a cheerleader and understanding the power in that collective capacity and the training I had from cognitive coaching and teaching that to my students so that they could be more mindful. They teaching them about consciousness and craftsmanship and flexibility and interdependence and how all of those pieces that we can be intentional about the way we engage with one another. And, and within my district this year, I have the privilege of supporting at the secondary level, which is kind of funny going from elementary and I'm finding that it's the same work. It's, it's learning how to teach students to be um, social and purposeful ways, and it develops that social emotional well being um, and helps us learn the content more readily. And, and thinking about the days lost when we think of the um, the students who maybe are not engaged in their learning, and we've had what 56 days, I think it was, collectively that are lost when we're dealing with behaviors. Well, when the students are engaged in dialogue and we're able to listen into their thinking, um, we know where to meet them and we know what they're interested in and we know the misconceptions they have um, and we can adjust what we're doing to meet them where they are, aside from the fact that they're having the opportunity to construct knowledge together in a way that's meaningful for them with their peers. Um, and so if we spent, invest the time teaching them how to be social in a purposeful way, instead of losing all that time from them not knowing how to do that well, because again, going back to those assumptions we make about them knowing how to think and behave, um, they actually, we, we gain time. We actually, because, because one of the uh, things that gets in the way of teachers thinking uh, uh, that it's, okay to spend time developing those social skills is that I have all this content to cover because I have um, an assessment that I'm held accountable for and rather they, they, act, they actually end up gain time because they know how to think and act together and again you get at better thinking when they know how to do it well together so um, Cheryl was an inspiration for me so with the proud Michigan educator campaign I wanted to highlight her celebrate her um, I was also able to visit Ganyard Elementary in Mount Pleasant when I was making a visit to Central Michigan University um, to share with pre-service teachers and when I was at Ganyard um, which I'll highlight in my next blog it's almost ready um, their the collective capacity that they developed there based on a teacher leader who took initiative to get professional learning communities up and running um, transform the work that was happening there and got them uh, from a focused school who was having some areas that they needed to really take a look at carefully and they turned it around drastically within just a very short time frame so I'll be uh, honoring them next month so thank you thank you Tracy appreciate Thanks. the good information Next up is state and federal legislative update. Marty Ackley will provide an update on state and federal legislative issues. And then, of course, we'll go to Cassandra as she has three comments. May also hear about NASB and Education Commission of the States. Hi. So the State Board's uh, Legislative Committee met on November 4th. Uh, several uh, items were brought up. Let me first say that you know, as a result of the election, uh, last Tuesday, uh, the House of the State House of Representatives um, stayed the same as far as Republicans and Democrats. The numbers are stayed the same, so uh, that still remains in, uh, Republican control in the House and the Senate and the Governor's Office. Obviously, um, the House Republicans did um, elect new leadership. Uh, Representative Tom Leonard will be the new Speaker. Um, he'll be in his third term. Uh, the new Speaker pro tem is Representative Lee Chatfield. New floor leader is Representative Dan Lowers, uh, and the um, House Democrats elected their leader, uh, Representative Sam Singh. Uh, so those changes will happen um, next next uh, session. Uh, but getting back to the legislative committee, um, the committee discussed a couple packages: a package of legislation dealing with seclusion and restraint, a package dealing with zero tolerance, and then there was um, a new bill in the Senate that was uh, would require all um, new school employees to be to go into a defined contribution plan and the um, committee discussed a uh, number of statements to make on those and I'll pass it on to Cassandra um, yeah so we have three statements that I had sent around um, the first one is on the seclusion and the seclusion and restraint bills 
and it basically just reiterates something that we've already said and redirects the, um, the legislature back to the statement that we made in May of 2016. Um, do we want to take each Take of a motion individual? to approve HB 5409 through 5462. Mm -hmm. Supported? All right, discussion please. Do we need any changes to any wording, or are we happy with the wording? I wonder if when we say it directs the legislature to the state board statement of May 2016, if we shouldn't attach that to the... I believe we do, do we? Yes, we can do that. Like the statement. Yep. Okay, so if there's no other questions on the wording, all in favor of the statement signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed the same. Motion carries. Can I have a motion on the second statement, please? HB 5618 through 21, 56... 93 through 95. So moved. It's been moved and supported. Is there any questions or comments on the wording, please? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed the same. Motion carries. Yes, John. Is how, how, given politics, how likely is this one to um, be supported? This is very important and something that we really need to make headway on in Michigan. Anybody have a feel for that? Well, the, uh, I looked at the bill sponsors, and this is, I'm pretty sure, what um, uh, the ACLU has been working on for about three years. So uh, I know that they, uh, Kyle, maybe you have information on this because it's restorative justice. Do you know anything more? Do you? The fact that these are House bills and they're sitting on the Senate floor gives a pretty good indication so that they so will they be have moved. Some Republican yeah. support. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the governor has been be pushing it. SB 102, can I have a motion to approve the statement, please? So moved. It's been moved. May I have support? Support. Is there any questions or concerns with any wording? Nope, you fixed students, so I'm okay. <laughs> All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same. Uh, Dr. Z opposed? I'll, oppo I'll abstain. Abstain. I don't see I understand the issue, do No problem. So seven yes, zero no's, one abstention, Dr. Z. Ocean carries. John? Um, I, I just wanted to note, you know, the, the funding of the system is, a, again, a huge issue um, alongside this issue of moving to defined benefit is the issue that we, we, we've had a growing number of teachers and public educators in the growing number of new schools and charter schools who aren't paying into the MIPSA system, which is undermining its its future ability to provide benefits. So, uh, you know, it, it's just important to acknowledge that fixing the problem should involve um, having all our educators be paying into a system so that we're not um, continuing to undermine its finances. And remember, we did reform the retirement system and it's in a lot better shape than it was uh, when, because of those changes. Still has a long way to go, obviously, but uh, we're in a lot better shape today because of those changes. Cassandra, please. Uh, the only other item I did send around, uh, I think last week, um, I, I had at least one parent contact me, but I know others were concerned about this, and that is the schools that serve as polling locations. Mm -hmm. um, and some of them, it, you know, some of them close for the day, but some of them only close for half a day. And there were safety concerns, um, particularly when you have such a contentious election, uh, that uh, th I think some people are genu genuinely concerned about having so many people going in and out of a school building when there are actually children present in that building. Um, and so I don't, I don't know if there's anything we can do about that other I mean, than we can encourage, encourage schools to be closed. Yeah, I, I believe, I know. yeah, I believe I got four requests to forgive the school day as a day of instruction and I granted all those requests. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if we could maybe make it clear to schools that we are willing to do that moving forward and maybe that'll help encourage them to... I mean, a lot of districts do off. do it as a PD day. That's what I did as a local soup. Yeah. Okay. So. I, I just wonder why, um, I mean, I would love to see it just be a state holiday. Just, that would take care of it, <laughs> you know. Um, it seems to make sense. If, if you want people to vote. Nice. All right, uh, Lupe, do you have anything on NASB? No, I didn't go to the conference, but maybe some of the people that went to the conference have something to. Anybody have something to share? What did you learn? <laughs> well, we got to see um, 
Michelle introduce Kathy and Kathy be honored. So it was uh, very, um, it was an honor for us to be on stage with Kathy to, to receive the, that award. Um, Pam, Pam moderated a session and spoke at a session on the environmental effects in schools. And apparently she's a real resource. They recognize that she's a real resource. She is, yes, absolutely. Among others. Thank you. It was great to have that, and, and thank you, uh, Richard, for coming. Um, but it, it was good to have that uh, topic um, on the agenda. So hopefully we'll see it again and see um, the enthusiasm and the interest to grow in, in that area. Okay. There's also a session that we were just that Kathy and I attended on um, ESSA and giving some guidance on what states should do although i sort of i and there was debate it was it was very interesting to hear the debate it was not a unanimous support and i forget who's podesta's group the, um center for american center. progress yeah. yes um center for american progress was um uh, they had some people speaking about that and um they wanted uh, uh, with a push um uh, on testing and keeping uh, testing but there was there's a lot of pushback on that, which I supported the pushback on the approach that that was. So, but it was an interesting debate and um, and uh, about what we what states should do, um, given the you know the flexibility that states have, and it seems to be not unanimous at all, um, and people sort of lobbying for whatever they think should be. So that was that was interesting to me, that debate. Eileen, anything on Education Commission of the States? Yes, uh, we are meeting in not quite two weeks, and I will be taking uh, the kind of thinking that's going into top 10 and 10 to them because there's this small group that's trying to figure out how, what recommendations to make to states as they stretch themselves for their vision on ESSA. And uh, it's interesting because the group continually finds topics I hadn't thought about. <laughs> so. Um, one of the things that they're going to be talking about is uh, focusing on the learner. Who are the new kids coming up? And I mean, just a slightly different stance. Um, the, those of us who have children in the school system are seeing it firsthand. Uh, but it's hard to uh, see the change as it transitions, and it's easier sometimes just to stand back and say, okay, what is going on that, that isn't working? Um, uh, and that's about it. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, moving on to consent agenda, are there any items the board wish to have removed? from the consent agenda prior to vote. If not, I'll entertain a motion. It's been moved and supported. Any questions or comments? Seeing all in favor, say aye, please. Aye. aye. Uh, opposed, nay. Motion carries. Comments by state board members? Anybody wish to make any additional comments? Eileen, please. Um, I just wanted to say that we, uh, uh, I'm okay with our board meeting schedule, but because of planning purposes for the, the department and outside groups, we do it early. and. I know that uh, uh, the two new uh, Republicans, Nikki and Tom, may have conflicts with the schedule. I've urged them just to get with you uh, yep. to discuss it. So. Yep. That's a good thing to remember. I, I don't understand. They can't come on Tuesdays? Okay. No, it's just that the, all the, the whole entire year is planned out, and they already have conflicts okay. with children, vacations, and things like that. So we'll, we'll take a look and see what adjustments, if yeah. any, need to be made. All right. Oh. Ten, oh, I'm sorry. Please, Pam. <laughs> and actually, we, we move uh, pretty quickly through the legislative um, mm -hmm. agenda item. But I just wanted to make sure we talked about the self-assessment and the uh, calling for the moratorium on um, any money spent on items that would uh, be derogatory um, towards some of our, our residents. Is there anything that we can do? John, you brought that up. Um, and what are you what's your thinking i know when you wrote when you sent that letter out again we got some positive results from that that brian you sent us some feedback on is there anything else that we can do yeah we're going to come yeah we're going to come with you for a proposed self-assessment okay. to send to schools okay that's what i took from yeah, john i think that so we owe you that the tribal leaders were asking for or the representatives <clears throat> from various tribes at one point they were asking for a, um, an inventory again to be done, which was relatively recently done by the Civil Rights Commission of which schools had what mascots yeah. still in play. And they were also encouraging uh, an additional step of asking schools to do their own self-assessment 
as a way to, I think, drive them to pay more explicit attention and acknowledge, you know, yes, we have these things and to update the inventory. Now, how and when that is asked for and what the communication is that says, please use this to, to you know, fill in the blank, to identify what you're, you still got and to have another serious discussion with your community about whether you're willing to replace it. I mean, that, the nature of that communication, I think, this board needs to. So I, I owe you a proposal yeah. on that. Okay, and can we call for a moratorium on the way that money is, is spent on? You can call on them, sure. Mm -hmm. Certainly, we, we could ask okay. call on local districts to not spend any more money on. Okay. All right. What an expensive. Now that we can't enforce it, but we can yeah. certainly yeah. call for it. Okay. And then um, there's the comprehensive financial report um, that they try to ask for. And if we have that, we'll release it to them. Okay. I mean, we have to. That's. Can on we our get list. okay? And we can get a uh, response we'll get back. Oh, on absolutely. That. Okay. And then I just wanted to thank the department because when I did that presentation, you all were able to quickly pull together information that helped us talk about some things that we're doing to um, address health as well as the academic outcome of children um, at the same time. Yeah, I mean, as throughout the meeting, I've written down eight things that we owe you, and those were two of them. Okay. I just wanted to mention. Yep. Yep. Um, uh, I met with and I've had some discussion with some folks from uh, Michigan Children's, um, mm -hmm. Michelle Corey. Um, they're, um, they're looking at um, uh, doing some informational um, things about trauma, in, you know, trauma-informed curriculum, working with kids that have um, uh, experienced trauma, uh, they're, uh, and trying to find a way to make sure that that is considered in um, and, and I'm assuming it is with the discussions about the top 10 and 10 and all that kind of stuff, as well as the librarians um, who, um, the, the group um, from the libraries, um, to make sure that that's involved. But um, so I'm not sure how much has been done with um, looking at, um, you know, this whole idea approach about trauma informed. Um, but I, I maybe to have somebody come and speak to it uh, in, in an upcoming meeting to, to talk about it. There's also, uh, by the way, a caucus, a special ed caucus in the legislature, which I was not aware of until she told me <laughs> you about think you it. Should be part of that. <laughs> yeah, it's a legislator. So there's, there's, um, it is by part, you know, both parties, both, you know, the Senate and the House. And I'm not sure if there's been connections with the MDE. I know sometimes when we meet, uh, we've in the past we've met with new legislators, education people. I would ask that the special ed caucus also be included. Um, you know, uh, Ben last year had had a meeting where the state board met with uh, the appropriation and appropriations and the ed committee folks, and I would like for the special ed folks to be there as well. Sure. And finally, the we've been meeting um, in and Eileen too via phone um, with the special ed task force and um, all around the uh, issues around the complaint process and um, how to improve that and, uh, and uh, it's been very interesting um, and we're looking at the model that was used for um, pro uh, defend uh, defenders for people who can't afford it and a model that's being discussed for that to maybe um, to be able to provide families with legal assistance in some way um, because oftentimes they cannot uh, in these hearings if it goes to you know the school district can have a lawyer and usually has a, able to afford a lawyer through their insurance or through their funds but um, looking at um, approaches to make sure parents have access to enforce their rights as well so it's it's very interesting but um, and I'm sure we'll have and you as you may recall eventually. when I talked about the five points that I'm working on in special right. ed that was one of the five as well right. and the lieutenant governor and I have been meeting and our right. my five align with what you guys are doing thank you do you feel there's headway being made in the right direction on uh, the I think education I, I, agenda? Do. Yep. I do okay good yeah. I think everybody does okay next Okay, and then Kathleen. Okay. Okay. 
I, I would like to say to the you, uh, our superintendent, and all my colleagues that are part of the MDE, uh, thank you for uh, taking that charge, that, <coughs> the, the little charge that I, I asked. I'm going to call it the playground talk that's happening in the schools as it relates to uh, all these racist remarks that children mm -hmm. are saying. And you took it upon yourselves and you wrote something real fast which, because it needs to go real fast. It has to stop on its tracks. And also, uh, I would like to point out, I looked up social justice in education. I, I Googled <laughs> that. And I want you to please go and Google social justice in education. And you will find all the ways, many, many different ways, that social justice is integrated into education. That is a passion of mine. It is something that I strongly believe in. And, and so I, I just want you to, to feel comfortable with what I believe, and I think some people around the table feel like I do. So there's more research, more implementation of the term in education that, we, that I even knew of. So thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. And then Eileen? Well, I, ju I just want to say you probably thought of it already. You know, I'm sure you have, but it's not too early to start planning for orient orienting the new We've already invited them in. And the new legislature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the new leadership. But they might need some help. Eileen, please. Um, I just wanted to say that the, um, the sad um, situations that have evolved over the country since the election lead me one more time to implore the board uh, for Michigan's sake. Uh, since we are, I'm trying to remember the statistics, but I think that we're top in high school uh, cyberbullying, and I think we're second highest in the country um, in bullying overall for high school. And I really, uh, I, I, when we were doing the uh, research on the LGBTQ guidelines, I found that Connecticut had done a spectacular job of working on anti-bullying with the entire um, a group, all the groups that could possibly be leveraged. Uh, in our case, it'd be the Attorney General's uh, okay to say, from uh, that to the Wayne State uh, uh, Child Protective Services people who are helping transgender kids stay in their families. But it seems to me that there's a moment here where we should be using the lessons of, um, that are unfolding to us to recognize that <laughs> unless the board leads on this issue, um, uh, it's not going to get better for K-12 kids. It doesn't matter who you are. <coughs> and I don't see a reason to stand back on it. We're having it displayed to us uh, in this last year rather graphically. I think it's just time to deal with it. So what do you suggest? Well, I, I'd like to uh, c do convening. I mean, I, uh, the, I've read the Connecticut document about four times, but not recently. And uh, there, it seems to me that there, um, uh, I don't think it was the department who did it there. It might have been their equivalent of the Michigan Association of School Boards. Um, but we're in a position, I, I know that there's not staffing for this, and Kyle you know, Kyle's over there like this. Uh, I know that we're not staffed to do it, but I think that there are other entities that would join us in pulling together school personnel, social services people, any group that, um, ministries, uh, anything that can be leveraged so that we start trying to help schools with their limited staffing, even though we're talking about social workers and social supports, there are outside groups that could be uh, leveraged to try and create a different environment. We've got to do it. I mean, mm -hmm. From the community foundations to everybody who cares about civil society, I don't see an upside to letting this slide anymore. And it, mm -hmm. to build on what, what Brian has done already. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is, it's, it's, there's stuff that's out there that's doing um, a limited but really good things, and people need to know about it, and they need to know what, what, to be do, what can be done. And I don't know whether Department of Human Services, but somebody should be able to seize control of, of the outside services, and we need to be offering um, some sort of a um, responsible template for people to uh, change how, how they're functioning with their kids. Thank you. Follow up on that. Pam? And thank you, Eileen, for that. And to um, piggyback also on what um, Lupe was saying is that we do have to address this as a social justice <coughs> issue. I'm in this. This is racism. 
um, and we have ethnic issues. So we're, we have to, ethnicity issues, so we have to address this from, from the root um, of where it is, and we can't be afraid to do that. I um, would also say that, um, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> it was it important. It has been a very long day, and it will, it will come to me shortly. I know what it is is um, educators, making sure that our educators, um, and this perhaps was included in, in your uh, bullets or points that you did along with the Civil Rights um, Commission, is making sure that our educators are properly and adequately equipped. I know in Saginaw, I, without going into details, we're dealing with some things that are um, happening within an institution. And so um, having to deal with some of the staff there um, in their excitement about their candidate that they were so, that, that they were supporting winning um, they were putting out spewing out some racist um, terms as well as some things that were derogatory towards the people that they serve and so it's uh, spreading pretty quickly and it's and it's affecting a lot of people um, and that's something that that employees were doing on their personal um, social media, but it was uh, it's finding its way into the workplace. So I, I'm thinking making sure that we're supporting um, educators, supporting our school systems to make sure that they're able to to address these issues as well in the workplace. That's what I forgot. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Future meeting dates: uh, December 13th, 9:30; Tuesday, January 10th, 9:30; Tuesday, February 14th at 9:30. If you have anything you want to see on future agendas, let us know. I know that we have scheduled the February meeting to be on ISDs that you requested, Dr. Z, and we've got other items that were mm -hmm. on our list still that we've got to get to you, and you gave me like 10 more today, so we'll get them. Mm -hmm. It's all good. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.